Uh, welcome to our next in our series of horticulture classes. Today we're going to be talking about how to harvest your peak season vegetables. Um, we're not talking about the early stuff like the leafy greens or radishes or whatnot, but um, getting into the nitty gritty of how to tell if something is ready, how to tell if you want to get further along or if you if it's time for you to harvest your vegetable. I'm Cassie Anderson. I manage the Master Gardener program in Adams County and I love vegetables. So it's always fun to talk about the veggie side of things. All right, uh, so we're gonna dive right on into it. Um, and I'm kind of working alphabetically. There's that, that's the main way that I'm organizing these. So that's why we've got beans first and foremost. Um, which are one of my favorite crops actually. They're really satisfying and if you're new to growing vegetables, beans are one of the simplest ones to really get in your garden. They are a large seed, they're a tough plant. If you overplant a little bit then you're pretty much guaranteed a crop. We do have a few pesties that like to eat them when they're in the really young stage, but they're a good overall choice. And when you're planting your beans, the type of bean is really important for deciding how you, when you are going to harvest your bean. So if you're planting green beans or string beans, you harvest them when they're slender, uh, before the beans have really begun to swell. I picked this picture because you can actually see up here, there's a little bit of swelling. You can actually see some delineation between where those actual beans are swelling. That particular bean is getting a little bit past its prime. It's perfectly fine to eat, but instead of being juicy and sweet, it might be a little bit drier, a little bit woodier, more starchy flavor instead of those carbohydrate sugars that we are really going for when we're harvesting our beans. If you're harvesting for dry beans, you leave them on the plant until both the bean and the husk are dry. That can take a little bit a while. And then two that a lot fewer people plant are the tepary beans, which are native Southwest bean. These guys are high in protein. They are also, you're also going to dry them onto the plant just like a dry bean. Fava beans or broad beans are one that we don't see quite as much of, but they do actually grow quite well here along the front range in Colorado at least. Um, their best plant, <coughs> excuse me, they're best planted as an early season crop uh, and when we have cooler temperatures. Usually the few times I've done them, you can harvest around now um, is about when they throw their crop and they are a one crop and done. So if you have pole beans, then it's important to know that pole beans, they produce all year long, um, all season long, uh, as long as there's no frost. And so pole beans are perfect for if you have a family, if you want continual harvests and you don't have a ton of space. However, they do desperately need a trellis. Uh, if you don't trellis them and you just let them pr prostrate across the ground, you are not going to get a very good crop. You also need to make, and um, when you're building your trellis, you need to give them vertical supports because they twine around, you can see in this picture, they twine around the vertical support. Uh, the first, I grew up always growing uh, bush beans and I tried pole beans a few years ago for the first time and I put cross um, lines for them and they couldn't quite reach to the next cross line very well before flopping over. And so having that vertical support is really important when you're building your trellis. But most important consideration for your pole beans is to keep picking them. If you let them start to mature out, if you let those beans start to swell, then it's going to signal to the plant, hey, I've done my job. I'm good to produce for the next year. I don't need to keep producing new flowers and new seeds, so I'm done. So if you keep that picking going, then it's gonna keep growing from the tip and it will keep producing more for you so you can keep that production going. Bush beans are a lot of people's favorites because they are much easier to do. You don't have to put poles up, you don't have to support them in any way. Typically a bush bean will throw three main crops over its season. It won't, and those three crops will be fairly 
quick in succession, a couple weeks apart. So if you want to ensure that you have good solid production through your season with bush beans, you want to succession sow them and keep and make sure that you stay on top of picking that first flush so that you get those next flushes of crop production. And these guys are the same. You want to harvest them before those beans really start to swell. Usually the beans are going to be very, very circular and it's going to be dependent on the variety that you pick, how long it's going to be or what size it's going to be. So when you're harvesting your snap beans, you want to make sure that you look at the diameter of the pod, not the length, because the length is determined by the variety. These beans are in perfect condition to be picked, maybe just a, a day or two beyond where I would often do it. Um, make sure that you, the time of day that you harvest is important. Of course, if you, in normal times, I work full time, I don't harvest anything in the morning when it's ideal. I harvest it late in the evening once the sun goes down just because I don't have time in the mornings to go out and harvest crop before I go into the office. But if you can, ideally in the cool of the morning, right after the dew evaporates is an ideal time to really get that crop, you're going to get the best flavor at that point. When you are harvesting your, your beans, you don't want to just take it and yank it off the plant. You can, if you've got um, a pair of scissors or a sharp knife, you can clip them off the vine or you can also um, just pull them gently off. Usually the connection pops off pretty easily. You do wanna make sure that they cool down fairly quickly. You wanna cool them within two hours of harvesting them and store them in the, in the refrigerator, usually with what we call a humidity pad, a damp paper towel in a plastic bag or a paper bag, something that just keeps them a little bit moist um, until you are ready to eat them. For harvesting your dry beans, I think I've already said, but you let the beans get swell and wait until they are papery dry. Um, you want to make sure that you give them time beyond when the pods dry because the beans take a long time to dry. Check the bean that the beans are completely solid. You don't want to be able to indent with a fingernail into those beans. If you can indent with a fingernail and it's not really solid like the beans you'd buy at the grocery store, then they're not ready yet. If you're pushing into late September, early October, and you see a frost on the horizon, this is the time to really make sure that you get in and you harvest your beans and pull them out of the freeze. Dry beans that freeze before they are fully mature are not going to do as well for you. Um, and there's a chance that it might cause a micro crack and you might get some moisture in there and then you'll, you won't have good storage for them. All right, on to our next crop, broccoli. Broccoli is also coming up um, pretty well at the moment. It's about the right time for first or second harvest for your broccolis. Uh, this is actually a picture from one of our master gardeners this year. Um, she had a lot of good luck with her broccoli. The heads on your broccoli should be dark and bright green. They should be closed. You shouldn't see any florets um, uh, or any flowers starting to open. This, the broccoli head that we eat is actually an immature flower. So it would eventually start to expand and all of these little curds will open up into a flower. You wanna make sure that it is nice and dense and the stems are bright green. You can leave the plant there um and let it start to grow side branches there are some varieties that are much that have been bred much more for side branching after the harvesting of the top crown some don't do it at all so re make sure that you know what types you have or just leave it and see if you don't know what type you have see if it starts to give you some side branches i know a couple of varieties i've grown have given me side branches enough that i can harvest about enough for one meal a week for the rest of the season sometimes if i get super lucky when you harvest your broccoli, cut it off with a sharp knife, nice smooth cut, and cool it as quickly as you can. Store it cool, store it in your refrigerator. Brussels sprouts. Uh, if you can fight the aphids off, these are wonderful to have from your garden. Um, the sprouts grow along with stalk. You usually want to harvest them when the, when the sprouts themselves are about one to two inches in diameter. And the sprouts don't mature all at the same time. You can see here, there's nice big ones down here and little itty bitty ones up here. You wanna harvest this section first. Next week you might do this section. Next week you might do that section. 
and you don't want to harvest the whole stock and bring it in necessarily. I know at Thanksgiving you see these, especially at like some of the smaller grocery stores, they'll just have whole stocks and it's super fun to buy the whole stock, but you're not getting the very best product. The ones at the bottom, the larger ones might be a little bit overdone. The ones at the top might be a little bit under, under ready. Um, and of course, as you're harvesting this, you'll see this on every slide, cool your, cool your harvest as quickly as you can. All right, moving on into our onions. Um, onions are really nice because they give you an indication that they're ready to be harvested. They do what we call lodging. They actually, uh, there comes a crease in the neck of the onion right here. They flop over. And so when about three quarters of your row or your bunch of onions have, have lodged is the time that you can start thinking about harvesting them. You can take a shovel and cut the roots underneath, um, or you can just start to gently tease them out with, as, you, as you pull them out. You don't want to use any tools that are going to stab into the bulb of the onion because then your storability is going to pretty much go to, I'm eating this tonight. Um, once you've harvested those onions, you want to clip the roots off and you want to clip the tops off and let them air dry, preferably in hot shade, um, for a few days. At that point, depending on the type of onion, you can then bring them in and store them. Our red onions are not, and white onions are not going to store nearly as well as the yellow onions. Yellow onions usually have the best storage capabilities, and so kind of sorting between what varieties you have is going to be the most useful when you're thinking about how to how to harvest and how to store your onions. And a lot of onions, um, especially some of the yellows, they can store for a whole, a whole season. Uh, we normally in our office do an onion variety research trial. Um, and I typically have onions from last year's harvest through to the, almost to the next year's harvest. Like I have a few onions left this year still from last year's harvest, which we did in August. So sometimes they can store pretty well. At this point, there's a lot that are starting to grow and they, a lot that have gotten um, susceptible to molds and other disease issues, um, so they're not so good for eating, but they can store for a good long time. Um, and I had a whole slide on that. Um, so yes, the more pungent types with higher salt, um, that, um, that have higher solids in them store longer. The milder onions are rarely going to store for more than a month. This is actually a picture of my setup. You can see I've got some pretty good onions. There's one pretty nasty one I need to go in there and pull out. Um, and I just, I store them on the bags that I bring them out in and a closet down in my basement. Um, theoretically, you wanna store them cooler than my basement. Um, if you want the very best longevity with a fairly high relative humidity but I understand that's not always possible in a lot of situations. All right, uh, next up we are on to garlic. Uh, everybody's favorite condiment to eat as long as you're not gonna be too close to anybody. Uh, but for garlic, so this is one, if you've planted it, you want to have planted it last fall. Um, it's not one that we, it takes, it's a two season crop essentially. Um, and the, we're starting to get close to the point at which our garlic that we planted last fall is going to be maturing up enough that we can harvest it. Generally speaking, you can take a look and see that the leaves have started to brown. About two thirds of the leaves are browning back. That's a great time to pull that garlic out and cure it somewhere in a dry, warm location for, al for almost two weeks. Um, at that point, you can cut the stems down to an inch, or you can do that fancy garlic Brady thing and hang it up in your in your garden in your kitchen. Although you don't keep the best flavor profile when you store it that way. Um, and these guys are going to last probably for a, a, a season for you as well. So if you plant enough of them, then you don't have to go to the grocery store for garlic. And if you harvested your own garlic, then you can save some of those cloves to plant this coming fall. So it's kind of a win-win if you plant a few extra garlic. 
Scallions are botanically any young crop of onion, shallot, or leek. And so these are essentially any immature crop. Um, scallion and green onion are terms that you can use interchangeably. And these ones are pretty easy. You can harvest, you can plant, if you plant your onions densely, then you can grow these up and you don't have to wait for them to bulb up. And you can harvest as desired. So you can pull one or two with your meal as you want to. Um, and just be aware that if you leave them for a long time, then they will turn into an onion or a shallot or a leek potentially. So you want to make sure that you, if you're planning to, to harvest them as scallions, that you do so at that appropriate size. Potatoes. So potatoes were not near, not not very near our harvest time for them yet. So I didn't, I included a little bit of maintenance information on them as well, since potatoes for to get a really good crop are a heavy feeder. Usually you would apply about a third of your total nitrogen when you plant them, and then three more applications two weeks apart uh, over the remaining few um, six or so weeks. So if you haven't been out and fertilized your tomatoes or your potatoes recently, it might be a good idea to do so, just to make sure that they're getting enough nitrogen to give you good sizable tubers. How do I tell if my potato, oh, I'm so bad at tomato and potato, um, how do I tell if they are actually growing for me? You can stick your finger in, you've, got, you've all got perfect garden soil, I'm sure. Stick your fingers in and actually tickle them. You can feel around for those swellings. Usually you'll check about six weeks after planting, and we're a little bit beyond that, but it doesn't do any harm if you haven't checked for potatoes, then you can definitely check now. Once you are ready, uh, probably in another month or so, uh, to think about harvesting your potatoes, you wanna stop your irrigation two to three weeks before you're planning to harvest them. This stimulates the plant to stop producing new tubers and to kind of put all of its storage energies into those tubers, which is what we want to eat. Remove the vines completely before you start to dig. Um, and I really like to use a garden fork when I harvest my potatoes. I find I lose fewer potatoes to, due to stabbing, um, but I, know, I have a couple colleagues who swear for the exact same sort of reason that, they don't, that they'd rather slice a potato in half than have a hole poked straight through it. So it's really up to your preference, but I find the garden fork works really well for me. Um, once you have harvested your potatoes, you can keep them so up to 10 months under ideal conditions, which is usually 39 to 45 degrees with a really high humidity. Um, so if you can, I mean, this is, this is the time when we all wish that we could go back to the olden days of root cellars because potatoes do so well in a root cellar where that humidity can be really high. And there's really low temperatures. But the most important thing when you're storing your potatoes is to make sure that you keep them out of the sunlight. Um, potatoes have, name has just flown out of my head, but the, when they're exposed to sun, they turn green. And that green compound, it's not gonna kill you, but it's gonna give you a heck of a stomach ache. And so it's one to avoid. If you, don't, if you don't have it in the light, then you don't have the problem. If you go to grocery stores at night, you'll usually see the potato section is covered with dark cloths, and that's the reason why. Um, they want to prevent that greening that can happen. All right, our root crops. So carrots and parsnips, beets and turnips, a lot of those are coming up mature. I know I have to go out and, and harvest my beets this year um, in the next week or so. You can always pull a test carrot or a test um, beet to see, you know, like, you, you don't even have to pull it all the way. You can just kind of pull on that top a little bit and just see what the, sh what the size and shape of your root is. Uh, sometimes if you've got carrots, you, they might, the soil might be around them a little bit more than you can really see well. So if you just kind of pull it, kind of crack it to the side, you can see how they're sizing up. If they're not sized up yet, leave them be, give them another feed maybe if you haven't fed recently, make sure they're getting enough water and wait for a little, wait for another week or two. But let's say they are ready. Let's say they look like these pictures. That's when you can use something like a garden fork to loosen the soil so that you can pop them out of the soil much more easily. Um, once you've pulled them out, 
I like to use like a dry brush and kind of brush all a lot of the soil off of them um, and then clip those tops off of them as soon as possible. The tops will continue to ha trans uh, transpire, they will continue to metabolize, and they will pull all of those sugars that you really want from those roots out. So the flavor will diminish the longer you keep those tops off. Um, and then store them as cool as you can in your fridge is a great place. Carrots will store for a long time in your fridge. Um, if you do want to, you can also store them if it's a later, later crop, you can store them in ground. Um, and if, as long as you mulch the ground in really well, so you, you can put straw or hay, or if you've got disease-free um, leaves from your trees, you can put the as a layer over the top and then you can pull from it into the winter. Um, you don't want to let them freeze though. If you let them freeze, then they're gonna get mushy and gross. That's the, that's the reason for that thick layer of mulch because it'll act as an insulating blanket. It will keep it from, from getting frozen to the point where they lose all cell structure and just get mushy and meh. <laughs> um, parsnips, you're gonna treat pretty much the same as carrots, but they have a much longer season. You're not going to be able to succession sow parsnips. You are going to start them early in the year and harvest them usually around the first frost. Uh, and they are a really good one to keep in the soil uh, into the winter because they tolerate cold temperatures really well and they actually get sweeter with frost. So they're a good one to kind of hang on to and have some patience and then you can make some gorgeous parsnip soup or something in the winter. All right, our root crops of beets. Um, beets usually, and this depends on the size, there are some different shapes and colors and um, added uh, growth patterns for beets. But most beets, the typical beets, you're gonna harvest when they're about an inch and a half to two inches in size. Um, and that's gonna be a very similar process to carrots. You'll loosen the soil with a fork or with a shovel and pull them out and clip the tops off before you refrigerate them. Uh, you can, if there, there's a lot of different really tasty ways to prepare beets, you can roast them in the oven, you can do them in an Instant Pot, you can do them, uh, pickle them into a vinegar. Um, but you, these are ones that are not good candidates for overwintering in the ground. They have a shorter root system, they are not as, they're not as insulated by the soil against freeze, so they are a good one to pull out before we have a freeze. All right, and then our final root crop, our turnips. These guys are going to be a very early season. These are almost like a radish, um, but they take a little longer, so they're usually about harvested, harvesting time around now. Um, and you can pull them up just like you would at the beets. Uh, and you want to wait until they're probably an inch to two inches in diameter. And depending, of course, on what variety you have. Uh, the Japanese white is going to be a very nice, very small uh, turnip with a fairly mild flavor. And they're kind of nice in sautés or just eaten fresh on a salad. All right, we're getting into the solanaceous, the ones that everybody's actually here waiting for, I'm sure. Uh, eggplant, you want to harvest before those seeds mature, which obviously you can't tell when before you cut the plant open. But you want to make sure that that pod is nice and firm and it's shiny. And you can tell if it's firm and shiny, even if you've got the white varieties or the little uh, lantern purple varieties. You can also indent with your fingernail um, and see if an indentation stays around. If this calyx, the green part, starts to brown, then you probably left it a little bit too long. So you wanna make sure that you're harvesting while this is still nice and fresh and bright and green. And you do wanna use some kind of sharp implement, whether it's scissors or a knife to cut the, to actually clip the fruit off of the plant. You don't wanna pull it off because then you run the risk of tearing the whole plant and that can be problematic for the health of the plant and for it giving you more fruit in the future. Peppers are gonna be very, very similar to 
um, eggplant, you're going to want to clip them from the plant. You don't want to pull them off. I will admit one that I am not as good at on this is the shishito peppers. It's one of my favorite peppers because they're very prolific. One or two plants will give you enough crops for multiple meals each month. Um, and I do have a bad habit of going and just popping them off manually. But do as I say, not as I do. And make sure that you clip them off carefully, pull them out of the sun as soon as possible. They are very susceptible to sun scald as soon as they've been harvested. And store them in cool, uh, fairly high humidity area. Your fridge is perfect for a pepper. All right, and then of course, everybody's favorite, tomatoes. Um, so when you're harvesting tomatoes, you can harvest a tomato as long as it is not dark, dark green. Dark green tomatoes are considered immature and they will not ripen even if you harvest them. The other term is breakers. Uh, this is when you see just a little bit, this, this is already at the pink stage, but this one back here is kind of at the breakers stage where it will, it's got that first little blush of color. It's not dark green and it's maybe just softening just a smidge. These will start to ripen on your, on your counter fairly well if you need, if you're pushing up against frost, which when you've got these big brandywine and beefsteak style tomatoes, fairly often with our season, we're pushing against that first frost. So it's important to understand. If you come up against that first frost and you've still got a lot of green tomatoes, then you can look for those different stages of ripening. So this guy right here is probably not going to ripen on, it, on its own. That would be a good one to harvest green and cook as a green tomato. Um, you can also, and you can pick the pink ones and ripen them on your, on your countertop. It's best if you, I mean, we, none of us ever leave a tomato on, on the vine, I'm sure, but generally speaking, you want to make sure that you're, harvest, that you're actually harvesting all of your tomatoes so that you don't have other pests and nasties coming in. Um, when you're planning to harvest, you want to make sure that you clip these guys again. The, a lot of the heirlooms have these knuckles on their stem that will tear and sometimes tear all the way back to the main stem of the plant. And that can be problematic for the health of the plant in terms of producing more for you overall. If you've got the softer tomatoes that turn mushy when they're fully, fully ripe, those that are black, beefsteaks or ox hearts, you should harvest these just past that pink stage when they're about 90% colored up and that's going to just give you a lot better quality control. You'll still have all the flavor if you let them vine ripen for that long. All right. So that was tomatoes. Um, I suppose the one thing I didn't talk about with tomatoes was if you've got little cherry tomatoes, those guys you usually don't need to clip. Usually when they're ripe, they will pop right off their calyx and you can just eat them right there in the garden. <laughs> Um, our next one, I'm sure a lot of people who have a vegetable garden are running across these right now, your summer squash. Summer squash are so variable in how you can harvest them. I actually, I really love this picture here because it shows you numerous different stages. So you can harvest a, a summer squash at any size. You can harvest it at the flower stage. Let me tell you, har um, squash blossoms in scrambled eggs is an amazing breakfast. Um, but you can harvest them when they're really, really little, uh, just two or three inches long, and you can pickle them just like you would your cucumbers. You can wait for them to be typical zucchini size, that kind of six to 10 inches before those seeds have started to swell for your standard uses in stir fries or bubble and squeak or what, uh, whatever, you, uh, shredding up for zucchini bread, that kind of thing, whatever you like to use your zucchini for. If you let them get to this marrow stage, um, once they're really large, they have mature seeds, their skin is really tough, then you can, you can still eat these guys, but you want to clip them off. You want to cut it in half, scoop out those seeds and discard the seeds, whether you roast the seeds or give them to chickens or compost them. And then you can stuff that hollow with your stuffing of choice and bake it. Um, this is actually the preparation they do in parts of Europe. Um, 
they don't they don't eat them as often as little as small zucchini so all hope is not lost if they get to this stage although i will confess i i throw the marrow sized zucchini out to my chickens fairly often and they have a blast pecking them apart all right i need to we've got a few more slides but i'm just about right in time all right our winter squash so winter squash you're usually going to want to kind of look at where we're at in the season and you're going to want to make sure if we're coming into mid mid september or so that you start cutting back water so the plant doesn't grow a whole bunch of new baby squash since squash grow from the tip they will continually put out new flowers and new fruit along the tip and so you want to slow it down by preventing that and reducing your water will help signal the plant hey it's time to start ripening up the fruit that you've got if you do see new blossoms you can pluck them right off and allow the plant to put its energies into its existing fruit uh, once the winter squash is ready to harden usually it will color up um, if it's something like this this is a butternut squash um, and so you'll you'll see that nice coloring happening and you won't be able to dent the um, skin with your fingernail so that's and usually the the actual stem will start to brown just a little bit that's a perfect time to to harvest them out you can cure them in a warm, dry location for a few days before storing them somewhere that's cool and fairly dry. All right, so melons. Um, melons are going to be a little bit trickier. Usually, uh, one month after the plant flowers, melons begin to ripen, uh, sometimes around somewhere between 30 and 40 days. They should be fairly full-bodied and heavy for their size. So if you heft it in the garden, then it should feel kind of heavy, um, very water dense. Musk melons in particular can be fairly easy to identify when they're ripe because they slip from the stems. And I've got a picture of that on the next slide. Watermelon, the belly is going to turn a cream or yellow color and the tendrils that you can see in this picture right here start to wither up. Uh, they start to dry up and that's gonna indicate that that's dry. Be nice if they left those tendrils on when you're shopping for one at the grocery store so we don't all have to do that awkward knocking listening and weighing thing so musk, musk melons they're going to slip off their stem you can see that there okay cool i made it just in time all right so if you do have other questions i'm happy to switch switch over now and we can start answering questions looks like we have a little bit of a couple questions yes we are recording this it's going to be on our youtube page which i think i saw eric put in our chat do you need to cure potatoes uh no the most the more important thing for storing your potatoes is that you do not get you make sure that they stay very dry uh, you don't want moisture introduced into your potatoes uh, cucumbers yes you you want to harvest or uh, refrigerate your cucumbers after you harvest them it's going to give you the longest the longest life in the refrigerator uh, do you have cabbage suggestions I'm new to growing them this year ah not a lot of people grow cabbage usually for cabbage um, I'm guessing you're asking about what how to harvest them you usually want to harvest them while that head is that central head is pretty distinct um, and pretty compact and you would want to actually cut with a knife the under part of the cabbage and cabbage is one once you cut the plant you're you're taking the whole thing out uh, let's see would you follow the same instructions for rutabaga as turnips um yes i would i think rutabaga is pretty it's actually not one i've ever really grown um but yes as far as i know it's it's a root crop it's probably going to be fairly similar to the turnips or to beets not one that you would want to leave in the soil over winter peas peas i didn't put in because i figured most people were probably pretty much done with their peas uh, but it depends what type you have uh, if you're doing like the english shilling peas and you want to harvest them when the pods are swollen um, if you're doing something like a sweet pea then you harvest them when those pods are still very flat 
uh, plants in July for a fall harvest. You, for a fall harvest, you're going to be looking at everything that you planted last or planted for in your spring crop. So you can do your lettuces, your radishes, you can try another crop of peas, beets, uh, kale. Um, we are actually for grow and give, we're going to be doing a whole week in on the week of the 20th um, on what we should what you should plant how you should plant um prepping for a fall harvest oh that's a very good question for multicolored peppers when should they be harvested color wise does that slow production of the plant the longer the pepper is on the plant uh yes if you are leaving it on to fully color up um then it's not going to be pushing quite as many new flowers but generally speaking it depends how you're choosing to harvest them. So like a jalapeno or an, um, uh, uh, blanking on the other one, serrano peppers, we actually harvest those while they're still green, but if we left them on the plant, they would mature out to a reddish color. And so it depends what your goals are. If you're, if you're growing a, color, a colorful bell pepper and you want it to be colorful, then that one plant is probably only going to push a few fruits for you. Can you freeze summer squash to save for later? Do you blanch them first? Uh, yes, you definitely can. I don't know about blanching it first. Um, I do think that there is, oh, there's a really good app through CSU um, for the family consumer science side of things. Um, that can give you more information about preserving your summer squash. Oh, uh, that's a great question. Does the quality of arugula change when the plant flowers? Yes. The plant flowering, uh, which in veggie gardening we call bolting, uh, changes the flavor profile of the leaves. Usually you'll get more milky sap, you'll get kind of bitter agents coming out in the in the leaves and so if you start seeing signs of flowering and bolting that's the time that you turn tail and run and plant something new in that area um, or and I've let one of my lettuces that's bolting um, I'm actually letting it flower so because the pollinators really like it which vegetables do you notice the biggest difference in flavor between store-bought and homegrown what should I, should I grow besides tomatoes Oh, I would say for me, it's not even flavor profile, but satisfaction for me, peas and beans um, and the squash um, are probably my big three that I really always grow just because it's so, so much more satisfying. You can get a lot of product um, and a lot of produce with not a lot of area all the time. Um, but really even onions, you see a lot of difference in flavor profile between the ones that you grow yourself and the ones you grow in the grocery store. A lot of the, the root crop vegetables, they get stored for a long time before we get them on our, sh on our shelves. And so they've lost some of their fake flavor profiles over time by the time that they get to us in our homes. Uh, talk about rhubarb. So the time for harvesting rhubarb was probably about a month and a half ago. Rhubarb is a nice perennial, um, technically vegetable, but we use it as a fruit crop. Um, usually you want to harvest not more than about two thirds of the plant each season. Uh, let's see, how do you know if a pumpkin is ready to be harvested? So the pumpkins are going to be very similar to the winter squash, like I talked about, and you're going to check and see if that color is really there, unless you're growing one of the like the warty green ones, um, in which case you might look on the bottom and look and see if you've got a little bit of a pink blush or something at, where it's contacting the ground. And then look at that stem, see if that stem is starting to brown out and if you can't put your fingernail in it. So very similar to winter squash. Can you grow lima beans here? I have never tried growing lima beans. Um, I don't know if any of my coworkers who are on have grown lima beans, but that's not one that I'm terribly familiar with, but you could always give it a try. I don't know what their season length is even. Uh, if it's anything over about 120 days, then it might be a little difficult. But 
it's always worth a shot. I mean, I know folks who grow artichokes annually since they don't overwinter very well here. It sounds like a lot of dedication for a big plant um, to me, but definitely you can you can try and do a, you can try and grow a lot of things if you have the ability to extend your season. Uh, so if you've got some row cover or a window box or something like that then you'll have a lot more luck. Uh, Eric chimed in, he says that he's growing lima beans, no problem. Uh, and then another person also said that they are growing lima beans. Uh, someone who wants to know if they can cut the top off the scallion and replant it to get a second crop, you can to a certain degree. Um, I know that's one of like the, the favorite videos for the um, cheap kitchen tricks kind of videos that you see online that you can take the scallions from, from the store, leave the roots and replant them. And you definitely can. If you're planting them in the soil, then you will need to make sure that you give them some fertilizer. Otherwise they're growing from, from nothing. Um, and you should be able to get some crop. I don't know if you could get more than a second crop. Um, and I think I actually reached the end of the question. I'm happy to answer more questions. We've got a little bit more time. Otherwise, I do have our contact information here on the screen. And like I said, we will be recording this talk, um, or we are recording, and we will be putting it up on our YouTube page, which is Colorado Master, um, Colorado Adams County Master Gardener. Um, but if you have other vegetable questions, if things aren't working out, I don't know about you guys, but the earwigs ate all of my uh, squash and melons this year. So I had to replant. So all of my squash and melon plants are very, very small right now. <laughs> so I hope that I get some level of crop before the end of the season. But we'll be working up um, a new series of classes, hopefully to advertise next, we'll advertise next week um, or the week after. Uh, we do have one more class scheduled on this series of caring for your roses in the in midsummer. Uh, oh, that's true. Uh, what about corn? I rarely talk about corn because I find backyard gardeners have such battles with raccoons that they rarely get to the point where they have a crop. Uh, but corn, you're going to be able to tell if it's ripe and ready to harvest for um, because the silks on the tassel on the corn has started to brown up. Um, that's going to be a good time to tell that it's it's ripe. Uh, someone asked if I'm treating around my new plants for earwigs. I'm not. I keep meaning to go out and try and trap them, um, but I haven't. Can I plant peas now for the fall season? Yes, you definitely could plant peas now for the fall season. Uh, you pro you very might you might even get a crop if you plant them around now. If, it get, if we have an early freeze, uh, then you can even harvest peas just for the tendrils. The tendrils taste like a pea and you can include them in salads or whatever you would put your peas into. Uh, some other bemoanings about earwigs this year. The earwigs really are bad this year. Uh, if you want to try and trap them, then you can do a mixture of soy sauce and oil and that's very, that's super attractive and tasty for them. If you put it in a container, then they might, they'll go in and try and suck it up and drown. Uh, a lot of people will also roll up a thing of newspaper and soak it in oil or soy sauce and oil and attract them that way. And you just wanna make sure you throw that away. Uh, when my tomatoes get a black spot on them, what does that mean? Uh, is it on, if it's on the flower end of the tomato, it doesn't matter what kind of oil. Um, if, it's on, if the black spot is on the flower end of the tomato, then it's what we call blossom end rot. And it usually means that there's been erratic watering. Uh, so either a mixture of too little water with then too much water. Um, and there's also some connection with cool soils in the early season. Usually tomatoes grow out of having that blossom end rot in, towards the warmer part of the season. Um, and just making sure that you have good consistent watering is gonna help prevent it. You can still eat the, the tomatoes that have the black spot. It's, it's not anything that's going to harm us when we eat it. So it, 
might, I don't, I've never actually done like a side-by-side -side taste test to see whether it affects the flavor profile, but you can still harvest it and eat it if it does ripen. But yeah, consistent watering, that's gonna be the key there. Um, cilantro and dill are okay now to plant for the fall. Yeah, you can, you can do a crop of cilantro and dill. Um, if you, and just make sure that you get those up and growing. But one of the hardest parts of har of growing the summer crop is making sure that you keep those seeds moist enough to germinate. So if you just stay on top of your watering, especially if you're planting seeds. Uh, curly top tomatoes are okay to eat. I'm not sure what you mean by curly top tomatoes. If you mean the leaves are curly, um, if you can give me some clarification, I can possibly give you some better answer there. Oh goodness, I'm having Japanese beetles on my green beans. They do love beans. Um, Japanese beetle is going to be a growing problem for the entirety of Colorado eventually, but especially here along the Front Range. And really one of the more effective things in the small scale is hand picking. If you get a container of soapy water, you can knock them into it. Their stress response, their response to being attacked is to fall. So if you come at them from above with a container underneath them, they'll fall right into that soapy water. Uh, there are also a lot of um, pesticide options for Japanese beetle, and that's a longer conversation than I think we probably have time to get into right now. If you want to shoot me an email, we can get into some more detail, or we do have a really good fact sheet on Japanese beetle. Uh, the leaves are curled, but I have some tall, small tomatoes that are on the plant. So yeah, the leaves it depends what's causing the curl on the leaf. Um, if, it's a if it's an environmental cause, fairly often heat and a little bit of drought stress will cause the leaves to curl up um, and that will be just fine. If the leaves are curled because of some kind of herbicide issue, then you might want to consider what that herbicide might be. Um, there are some herbicides, if you're using a straw mulch, um, there are herbicides that are in the straw mulch that are problematic for the health of the plant overall. Um, we have uh, CSU extension that we had a request for an herb class for planting. Um, we have had a couple other folks who've given some herb classes. We have one on our YouTube page as well that I gave earlier in the season. Dill is usually usually the thing I hear about dill is that it takes over a garden so I'm not quite sure what um, what your troubles are but I would be happy to have a longer conversation with you over email uh, to see what you're doing and then there's also a question on growing cilantro that the woody the woody stem takes over quickly um, for cilantro, your best bet is going to be to make sure that you grow it quickly and that you grow it with a lot of good moisture and a lot of good nutrient so that you don't, so that that woody stem doesn't develop. And if you do start to develop a woody stem, succession. So have a few, have a few different, or plant a new little batch every week or two. All right. And rabbit versus lettuce. Honestly, the very best thing for the rabbits liking your lettuce, because I mean, who wouldn't we like our lettuce, um, is exclusion. Uh, you can get really affordable three foot fencing that will keep rabbits out. It's more narrow at the base than it is at the top. And usually if you can kind of dig it into the soil or mound up soil around the bottom, then they can't get underneath. And unfortunately, there's not a lot that's going to, to deter rabbits if they're hungry enough and determined enough besides excluding them from the area or massively overplanting and letting them take some and you get the rest. So not a good answer, but the best answer I have at the moment. All right. Thank you guys all so much for joining on. Um, I 
Hope, hopefully we sent out the poll so that we can get some results. Uh, see who we have here. Oh, let's see, I see somebody. I grew salad greens in window boxes on my fence. That's an interesting way to do it. Yeah, just get them out of the way. I like it very much. <laughs> yeah, think creatively too. That's an answer I didn't give. Come up with different places to plant things and grow things that they can't reach, for sure. All right, thank you so much. If you have thoughts on other classes you'd like to see, you can definitely let us know. We're, like I said, we are planning our next series and otherwise, we will see hopefully many of you next week for roses and have a wonderful day and happy gardening everybody. <laughs>